All right. Hey there. Welcome back, everybody. So uh, this is our uh, lecture series on the basics of economic regulation. This is uh, lecture 12. <laughs> We're getting pretty well into these. Um, uh, and this, this video lecture will be on the uh, economics of environmental e regulation. Now, uh, please know that this is a course on economic regulation and not on environmental economics. So we are really only touching on um, some of the peculiarities uh, of economic regulation that is often associated with environmental uh, or the environment. It is not meant to be a comprehensive presentation of the uh, regulation of the environment. As a practical matter, we, we cannot have a perfect environment however we might define that okay um, you know our, our very existence uh, um, as, as human beings on sort of planet earth uh, causes a certain amount of environmental damage and so that understanding that uh, we have to have some way to converse about what are the appropriate amounts of mitigation of environmental damage that should occur uh, and in what areas. Okay, a, a central idea to environmental regulation is, and indeed all regulation, is the assignment of property rights. Oh. If, if we're going to uh, require mitigation of the environment, uh, environmental damages, or if we're to put restraints on sort of how we can use the environment, then we need to have some idea about who's responsible for doing that. You know, is it federal government? Is it an individual? Is it a business? Is it a combination thereof? And an interesting concept or use and useful concept in economics uh, to think about how we assign property rights, how we assign sort of res rights and responsibilities, because with any right comes a responsibility, is this idea of Coe's theorem. <clears throat> and so Coe's showed that 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 under certain conditions, in fact, it, it actually didn't matter where you assigned property rights. So if, if markets were perfectly competitive in, um, actually, Coe's outlines uh, eight, let's get eight here. Here we go, eight. You know, so Coe's outlines actually eight criterion uh, that, are, that are needed. And if you have all those, you have sort of perfect competition. And in that case, it doesn't matter where you assign property rights as long as you do. Okay. And without going too long into to Coase's original paper, which you should read if you're uh, interested in these issues at all, uh, it's a it's a it's a good paper, right? And even though it's nearly 100 years old, it's relatively easy to read. But Coase takes the case of a uh, of of a farmer al alongside of a river, uh, and then some other uh, uh, in another individual down the river a ways, right? And you know the farm. So I shouldn't say farmer is raising cattle, <clears throat> rancher. <clears throat> the rancher allows his cattle to graze, right, and it causes a certain amount of damage to the river, which then, of course, that damage flows downstream, affecting you know another party. So, and so the question as asked is, you know, who who should clean up the river, right? <laughs> and I think the answer that most of us would would say right is well the rancher right it should clean up the river because they you know did the damage but Coase points out that another option would be to, to have the person downstream pay to have the rancher keep the cattle away from the river okay so you could have the rancher pay to clean up the damage from the river or you could have the person downriver pay the rancher to clean up river in other words you could assign the responsibility and the property right on either individual and he shows that under certain conditions uh, it doesn't doesn't really matter where you assign it that you get the same result okay and that's interesting because I think it's it's somewhat counterintuitive but Coase's point in his paper is that 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 only happens under certain conditions that we normally associate with perfect competition that in fact you probably weren't likely to get to that result so it, it actually does matter where you assign property rights because of this idea that that he sort of developed right this is what he's most famous for uh, is this idea of transaction costs and this is central to many issues in environmental economics 
Transactions cost refer to the costs associated with making a transaction. So, for example, if I'm going to buy a new car, okay, it's expensive, right? And so I'm going to do some research ahead of the time to figure out what car has the right attributes that I want, um, you know, what the sort of pricing is, what financing is available. I'm going to spend a lot of time doing that. That time is called, you know, my time is valuable and therefore that research is valuable, right? I'm going to incur that cost in order to engage in the transaction of buying a car. And as a consequence, buying a car has this transaction cost of the research time. So purchasing a car isn't just simply the price that I pay for it. It's the price I pay for it plus the time that I invested to learn more about this market. Okay, or what we would say explicit costs plus in this case transaction costs. Okay, now we can already see why this would have significant applications to the environment. Uh, we often don't know about the environmental damage that's being done. Okay, and more importantly, perhaps we often don't know the consequences of the environmental damage being done. Okay, there are a variety of transaction costs associated with negotiating property rights in the environment. Who owns the clean air? Who's responsible for cleaning it up? There are significant difficulties associated with even understanding these markets. And as a consequence, uh, the assignment of property rights becomes not only meaningful, but also difficult. There are m perhaps multiple users for the environment, all with different requirements in terms of quality of the environment or the degree to which pollution is not present. So here we see the idea that you know, if we have, we have water quality on the vertical axis and water pollution on the horizontal axis with sort of variety of sort of requirements, right? If we want to go fishing in that water, water quality can actually be relatively low. It can't be terrible because if it's so bad that if it poisons the fish or causes other problems in the fish that when we ingest those fish, <laughs> it causes us health problems, well then it's too polluted, right? And we can fish in water that's too polluted for swimming. And of course, we can swim in water that, you know, perhaps we wouldn't drink. Uh, anybody who's been to a public pool <laughs> should be aware of this differential. Okay. Uh, now, beyond uh, sort of the basic transaction costs and property rights uh, and duties assignment of the environment, okay, we have a additional problem that is fairly um, persistent in environmental regulation and that's this idea of heterogeneity so not all firms within an industry are the same it can be the case that we have firms operating in a given industry or that that ha have very different cost functions so they may some may operate at low cost relative to others that are operating at higher cost and it's going to be likely for some firms if we if we create a uniform requirement for say pollution mitigation uh, it's going to be the case then that some firms are going to be able to more easily adapt to um, that mitigation strategy than than others. As the firms that, that tend to operate at higher cost tend to be the smaller ones. Uh, they tend to be uh, more regionally focused ones. Um, they tend to be the firms that, that, that oftentimes sort of the community and, and people have particular attractions to. So, you know, it's not the, it tends not to be the, you know, the, the, the big uh, agribusiness company that has, has a problem uh, because they operate at lower per unit costs when compared to small family farms. And so there are both sort of, well, there's a lot of reasons why society uh, has a, a fondness for smaller family farms. Okay, um, so what do we do about that? Well, here we see the basic problem, right? Let's say we have two firms, you know, call it small farm and big farm. Small farm operates with marginal cost one, <coughs> and large farm operates with 
marginal cost too. So for any given amount of pollution mitigation, we see that the first firm has a higher cost than the other. Uh, we see, of course, that the marginal benefit is consistent uh, across, so this is marginal benefit, right, MB, is consistent across all firms, right, like, so pollution doesn't care whether it's, and receivers of pollution, <laughs> people have to breathe the air or whatever, or drink the water, you know, it doesn't, they don't, doesn't make any difference which firm made it. Fixing the problem is consistent. And so we can see then there that, that if both firms put in the same, right, so they both expend the same amount on mitigating pollution, they're, they're going to make it, they're going to mitigate different amounts of pollution. Right? Now, I don't mean to pick on sort of small businesses. Some of you may be out there saying, well, wait a second, I know a small business and they, they you know, they do a better job than anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to suggest that, that, you know, all smaller businesses are more challenged when it comes to pollution mitigation, but it, it is commonly so. Okay. Uh, and so I'm using it as an example. Okay. So let's say, you know, we have, uh, um, these, heterogeneous firms with different cost functions right then then we can sort of sketch out the the welfare effects as we you know commonly do um, if we you know sort of set uh, the the quantity of pollution control across all firms right and then we sort of have different different cost functions right we're going to have losses from high, particularly high cost firms due to uh, excessive regulation right and we're also going to have losses from particularly cost-effective firms from inadequate regulation. So basically, it's a similar problem to what we saw in the last lecture when we have sort of oscillating prices between low and peak demand. Um, if we have firms that face different cost structures and we set sort of one level of pollution mitigation, right, then any, and assuming it picks an optimal marginal cost margin benefits, right, any firm below that cost structure is inadequately re regulated. So potential users of the environment aren't getting the right amount of pollution mitigation and and the reverse is true uh, with higher cost higher than median cost firms okay so what do we do about okay, that okay there are a variety of options uh, the, the, that, that we use right the first of these is so-called pollution netting okay and uh, you know so you can sort of read read what's going on there but but what we're doing is we're allowing for uh, emissions at one plant to potentially offset another. So we're not so concerned with the emissions at any given particular plant. We're concerned with the emissions across a series of plants, right? And so if you have a firm or a series of firms, it's operating a number of say power plants and some of them are older and some are newer. The newer ones operate at a lower cost structure than the old one. What we might do is allow uh, the newer ones to mitigate more pollution or reduce more pollution while leaving the older ones to pollute a little more and then having our regulatory uh, interested in the sum or aggregate amount of pollution across all the plants owned by that firm or even within an industry. A second option are so-called offsets and this is one we hear about a lot, right? Pollution offsets are, are sort of in the media all the time. And uh, what we do here is we sort of set a maximum amount of pollution that an industry can emit. And then we allow firms within that industry to buy and sell uh, the right to pollute effectively. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, and a business, a, a, a larger firm or it may construct a series of new power plants or, or whatever, you know, it could, could be a, a lot of things. It could be like housing along a lake too. We allow a new firm to build a bunch of, say, new housing along the lake, and uh, and it's very pollution is very environmentally friendly, uh, and then as a consequence, they're actually doing better than the regulation requires. And so what we do is allow them to sell that to maybe other uh, home builders who aren't able to construct in that manner, and so the other home builder ends up actually polluting more than the regulated standard, but they've purchased. Uh, from our first builder, the right to sort of pollute. And as a consequence, the aggregate pollution across all new construction uh, ends up being uh, the regulated amount. Third idea uh, is this idea of bubbles, and then you see the fourth there too. <clears throat> okay, And so the, the, the bubble idea is what we're going to do is pick a particular geography, right? And say, okay, within this geography, 
uh, emissions, total emissions, you know, can't be greater than X, right? But individual emitters, so let's say the, the total amount of pollution is um, 1,000, just to pick a number out of the air, and there are 10 firms operating within that geography, okay? If they were all polluting the same amount, right, then pollution at any given plant would be 1,000 divided by 10, or 100, right, okay? Uh, but let's say that some of those plants are very good at minimizing pollution and they can build a plant that only pollutes 50. Well, that would allow some other plant within the geography to pollute 150, right? All, all things being equal. Okay. And so what we're concerned here about is um, emissions within a particular geography. Finally, the idea of banking, right? And that's where we, we allow a firm... Uh, to sort of have a, uh, a, a an emission requirement over a period of time. So perhaps today, you know, they're operating an older plant or something like that. It would be very high cost for them to mitigate pollution, right? And as a consequence, they run a deficit uh, in in their bank. <laughs> but then they build a new factory, and for the remainder of the period, right, they're actually under or they're cleaner than the than the requirement. Uh, is and as a consequence, when we look across that period of time, right, we um, we see that they've met the requirement. So all four of these, of course, are schemes for dealing with heterogeneity in firms' costs in terms of pollution mitigation. <clears throat> okay, now each of these, of course, has costs and benefits, or I should say, pros and cons. For example, with offsets, there's there's often sort of a, a moral claim that this isn't the right thing to do, right? That, the idea that you should allow individuals to sell the right to pollute somehow, I think, strikes some people as not being correct. Um, but, you know, one can see, right? I mean, the environment belongs to us all, sort of, right? We all, we all live here on planet Earth. So another question is, you know, is the environment itself homogeneous? Um, are all lakes and pollution mitigation on lakes the same, right? Is all... Um, is in this case is all water quality the same even ground pollution right is is all ground space the same you know probably not right i mean probably if we have uh ground water or or soil that's that's in agricultural regions or in areas where a lot of people live uh, it probably has mitigation of, of of environmental damage there is probably more valuable than in less sparsely and less utilized uh, areas of land. Okay, uh, but that again is is perhaps socially controversial. So there are a variety of sort of problems with any of these approach, or indeed all of them. And so this is again why sort of a social conversation is so important in these things. As economists, we may float this idea. We may suggest, okay, well maybe we could do a bubble here, or maybe we could do offsets here, or maybe we could do this or that, right? And then kind of see how folks react to that. If people like that idea, does it seem reasonable? Are we, can we get something done? Can we pr improve the environment by, by taking this approach, right? So uh, these are all sort of tools in our toolkit. Okay, hey there, I've made myself way smaller because <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff here that I sort of need to have on the screen at once. And this is the first one with a picture in it too. So it's an obscure uh, reference that entertains me, so find out what that's all about I'll be mildly entertained anyway so so this is a uh, what we call a payoff matrix this thing here and it's a way in which we illustrate problems in so-called game theory now this is also not a course of game theory so I don't want to go into that too much um, but what we are going to illustrate with this is the so-called tragedy the commons problem okay and this is a, a well-established uh, idea and a discussion point in in the mitigation of environmental damage and the short run of the tragedy of the commons goes like this is that everybody has an incentive to sort of over utilize common resources so everybody has an incentive to sort of you know use and abuse clean air everybody has an incentive to sort of use and abuse clean water this common resources right and so to build that discussion of sort of formalize why that is, right? So some people might say, oh, no, 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 it's not so. Okay, well, 
here's why economists make that argument. Okay, so starting with a basic idea of a prisoner's dilemma, here's a story quickly. We have two people who have been caught by, you know, they, they've com potentially committed some crime and the police have called them in for questioning. And they've put each of these individuals in different rooms, right? So suspect one is in one room and suspect two is in another room. They can't talk to each other. Now they're going to be interrogated or the police are going to question them to see, to ask them whether they committed a crime. And of course they, they have two options, right? They can say, no, I didn't commit the crime. Um, or, or they can say, uh, uh, yes, uh, we committed the crime. Okay. So they're speaking for both of them that have worked together. So either again, they can say, yes, we committed the crime or no, we didn't independently. Okay. The final part of this sort of story then is that if one of the prisoners implicates both of them, so if one of the prisoners talks, then the prisoner who didn't talk gets a more severe sentence, so has to go to jail for a longer period of time. Okay. All right. Now, in this matrix here, we see sort of the benefits and costs to each of our people who've been brought in for questioning. Right. Both of our prisoners cooperate. So, Prisoner one, you know, says, okay, yes, we, we went and, and sort of committed, or excuse me, if both prisoners uh, work together with each other and don't admit, right, so neither prisoner admits that they did a crime, then they get released. So they go free. If both prisoners say, yes, okay, we, you know, we did this crime, right? Then they, they go to prison for a given period of time, say P, okay? Uh, by the way, this is the outcome for player one, and this is the outcome for player two. One, two, one, two. So one is always below the diagonal and two is above. If player one does not admit uh, uh, that, that they committed a crime, but player two does, okay? Then, of course, what's gonna happen? Well, player one is going to end up, I don't know why they call it S and T, but in this case, <clears throat> player one is going to end up with a long prison term, longer than they did here, because of course they, you know, they, they, they did the crime and then they lied about it. Whereas the prisoner who admitted the case is going to get a short uh, prison term, so less than they would get here, so an advantage. Okay, when we play this game, uh, what we see is that each player has an incentive to sort of tell on the other one, right? To try to get a shorter prisoner term. And as a consequence, where we sort of end up with is here, right? Where they, they both sort of tell on each other. Okay, uh, that's that's sort of the, the, the obvious outcome of the prisoner's dilemma is you create a set of incentives whereby you uh, incentivize a certain type of behavior. In this case, we're incentivizing admitting you did the crime by offering shorter terms, okay? Uh, and then, you know, getting presumably the result that we want in this case of, of both going to prison in this case. Now, from the prisoner's perspective, this is not the best result, right? The best result, if they could actually trust each other to not <laughs> tell on each other, then they can go free, right? And this is sort of the problem of the tragedy of the commons, right? If everybody agrees to take care of the environment, then it all works out for the best, right? But individuals have an incentive to overutilize the environment or over damage the environment, leading to everybody over damaging the environment. Okay. Boom, we're back to a uh, large size. Uh, that That's it for this time. I've tried to keep this one short. I've actually, so if you're in this class, there's, there's actually a lot more in this slideshow that we're gonna be talking about in class, but we've gone on for a long time now. So I think we'll, we'll call it quits here. Uh, suffice it to say, if you're watching this as a casual view, viewer, there's a lot of sort of, that goes into regulating the environment. Uh, and, and it really has a lot of sort of unique uh, features uh, that we need to deal with. Um, largely resolving around uh, society's sort of attitudes about the environment, um, heterogeneities across uh, industries and across markets, as well as the problem of, you know, sort of property rights and who, who, 
who's responsible for the environment, uh, and how do we all sort of collectively take that responsibility for the environment. All right. Thanks again. Uh, we'll see you again next time, and uh, take care.